Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of everyone here at the HKBU School of Communication, uh, welcome uh, to this extremely important event that I'm very much looking forward to. It's the uh, great pleasure of uh, us at the Center for Media and Communication Research uh, to be hosting uh, this roundtable and launch of a new network. Um, I do so with a great amount of respect and gratitude. Uh, respect uh, because I know the work of the three scholars with us today uh, and I'm constantly, uh, I constantly marvel at how much they have accomplished uh, despite the, the challenges facing the research that they do. Uh, gratitude uh, because, uh, well, in my view, uh, there is uh, no area in communication and media studies uh, where the gap between demand and supply is uh, so great as in Chinese journalism studies. The demand, of course, is huge. The demand for um, deep critical reflection on uh, the media system in uh, one of the world's largest, uh, most powerful countries. Uh, the supply, unfortunately, is far, far below the demand. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful uh, that uh, our three guests here today uh, have decided to take it upon themselves, uh, not just to focus uh, on the uh, great research that they do as individuals, but to see how they can uh, catalyze similar work around the world uh, by junior scholars, senior scholars with uh, similar interest uh, and passion in researching journalism in this extremely important context. Uh, with those very brief remarks, I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to Kachinka. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, everyone, for coming to this uh, event. Uh, this, event, this event is a roundtable uh, discussing, of course, Chinese journalism research, but also a uh, uh, kickstart of a uh, res uh, researcher's network uh, who are interested in doing research related to Chinese journalism. So I'm really encouraged by this turnout, both in this room and also on Zoom, because Actually, the reason why it's real fast <laughs> um, initiated this uh, network is because we feel that no one is really doing this research anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really, really encouraged that uh, so many people turn, uh, 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 came here and are uh, really interested in this topic. So uh, I'm uh, Ke Cheng, I'm an assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, I will just start by sharing some figures, numbers with you about the field of uh, Chinese journalism research. So I did some uh, uh, basically uh, basic uh, literature review uh, search in the database about like basically how many papers have been published uh, in the past few decades about Chinese journalism. So if we look at this, uh, 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 sorry, look at this uh, bar chart, it seems to be increasing, right? Uh, from 2005 to recent years, the uh, absolute number of papers published uh, in, uh, in this database, collected in this database, uh, has been increasing. However, if we look at the orange uh, uh, line here, which is a percentage uh, of, this, uh, 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 of these papers among all the communication papers, there's no like significant increase, meaning that Basic the information, the, the message from this figure is that yes, there are more papers on Chinese journalism now as compared with 15, 20 years ago, but the percentage actually is not increasing because the uh, uh, overall field of communication is quickly expanding, but not Chinese journalism research. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So if we compare Chinese journalism research the percentage with the percentage of Chinese social media research, we see a very uh, uh, clear trend, right? Lots, uh, there are more and more uh, research about Chinese social media, but for journalism, it remains about only like three or four percent of the total amount. Yeah. So uh, if but if we look at Chinese journalism among all journalism studies, the trend seems to be better. Uh, I think the message here is that um, although Chinese journalism research has not been doing really 
a good job recently, but um, I think that's a problem not for Chinese but for journalism. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think uh, I think of course globally, journalism studies has been facing a lot of challenges, the same as the journalism industry globally. So that's of, uh, some uh, general trends here, and also uh, there's some uh, other uh, figures that you can look at. I think the uh, we also uh, ask you with the help with our uh, PhD student Guo Jun, who's also here. Uh, we did some uh, hyperlation here. The authorship. You can look at this authorship uh, across time. You can see that these Chinese nationals, uh, those who were born uh, in, in China, they also the number has been increasing, and also mixed. Uh, authors and also uh, for Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan institutions has been playing an increasing uh, part in pub publishing uh, works in Chinese journalism. And uh, this is research topics. And uh, so I think the um, as compared with journalism in other countries in other contexts, of course, the propaganda image branding has been a unique one. I think in Chinese journalism research and also. Uh, um, we can see that uh, there are other uh, topics that are more similar to those in other contexts. And in terms of methodology, uh, um, especially for those published more than 10 years ago, lots of them are non, non empirical pieces, but recently there have been increasing uh, trend of more uh, <clears throat> empirical based uh, studies. Most use methodology is still interview and content analysis, but recently there are a few pieces using computational or experiment with new uh, methods. So that's just uh, for your reference. And uh, so um, because I'm the first to speak, so I would like to start from the what among the five W and one H uh, in journalism, right? Because uh, I think the elephant in the room is that, like what on earth are we going to study if we study Chinese journalism nowadays? Because I think it's not uncommon for people to claim that Chinese journalism has Right. <laughs> is that right? Because uh, of course, due to political and also financial reasons. So uh, we are like the golden age of Chinese journalism is already like 15, 20 years ago. So like, if we still want to study Chinese journalism, like, what on earth are we going to study? So this is a question that I cannot answer, but I propose this question for you to all think of. Uh, in thinking of that question, I want to mention a recent piece published in Journal of Studies. So this journal, very interesting, uh, they set up a, a, a column called Provocations. So they invited scholars to write controversial pieces, to propose very controversial uh, arguments, and then invite other scholars to critique. So, and uh, in this very uh, first piece among this column, uh, Journal of Studies for Realists, uh, the authors uh, uh, argue that we should decenter journalism. So there, because for several reasons. First is that news is not primary media content that most people consume. <clears throat> There's no reason to think that news consumption is higher than 10% of the total media consumption, meaning that actually news is not that important uh, in people's uh, information diet. So that's a that's a that's a fact. That's a reality that we should face. That, of course, that that does not mean that journalism news is not important. The the message here is that news consumption is always embedded within this much broader range of media practices that have different cultural resonances with diverse topics. So I think this also helps us think about the question of what, because if we only focus on the narrowly defined news of journalism then our research focus, our research subjects will be very, very narrow. Okay. So that's the first uh, factor uh, behind the decentering journalism. The second is past audiences were not diligent news consumers either. We, we tend to blame social media, internet, uh, for the fact that people are not consuming news. They all consume short videos, TikTok, all those kind of things. But in the past, even in the newspaper era, People read newspaper, read newspapers. They not for like many of them not not reading for that for news, but for job and housing advertisements, weather reports, entertainment listings, and topics for conversation. So, 
uh, the author uh, argue that there's a trickiness of associating the value of medium with its content, and even more so a normative vision of this content, meaning that we should not like romanticize newspaper either. Even 50 years ago uh, in the US, people consume a lot of newspapers, but maybe not primarily for news. So the third one is news cannot be easily disentangled or isolated from the other forms of media, many of which do not profess to the lofty ideals of journalism, but are, are highly meaningful uh, not, uh, nonetheless. The boundary between a news object and broader media space is just not clear. So what is news and what is not news? I think even in the news people, uh, news people era and more so nowadays, I think the boundary is becoming more and more blurry. What is news? What is not news? What is journalism? What is not journalism? I do think we have a clear answer to that. But that also helps expand our research scope to reimagine what do we uh, uh, need to study. Last one is journalists try to isolate news from other media content, but this separation stems from both professional pride and an effort to establish authority. So we should not take that for granted. We should know that journalists try to do that because of professional re uh, reasons, because of uh, 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 they want to establish authority. So we should resist assuming the centrality of journalists and instead ask how they use such claims to bolster their authority instead of competing public voices. So of course, these are all from this piece. So I highly encourage everyone to read that piece and also the three pieces attacking this piece. And then they the also reply to those attacks again. So I think it's a very interesting conversation. So they, they, they uh, uh, propose some uh, research directions. They argue that the merits, uh, uh, the, we should focus on the merit ways people interpret the messages and what role uh, news in particular plays within different public's broader uh, information and repertoires. And uh, we should focus on how journalism work with and against other influential sources information on public affairs. We speak within people's sense-making practices from family, friends, colleagues to influential uh, political popular figures and content, algorithmically curated social media feeds, dedicated virtual uh, spaces, and many others. So maybe we should uh, uh, expand the what uh, much to include all these sense-making practices. So basically, center journalism means that placing journalism as one mediated practice among other uh, interlinking the, and overlapping ones, which is, so, so it's like, according to the authors, it's like shifting our focus on imagine Earth is the center of the universe, right? Earth is not, of course. And we should shift that to set imagining that sun is the uh, 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 center of the only, uh, at least in our solar system, right? So, this shift does not mean that Earth is not important. This shift means that we should uh, 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 understand and explain Earth uh, in a better way, in a more nuanced and comprehensive way. So to uh, it, like helps explain better how a variety of physical forces beyond our planet shape how our Earth works. I think this is a quite interesting metaphor that helps us understand this. So uh, lastly, I want to briefly mentioned. So according to that piece, I think we can draw some implications for Chinese journalism research. I think the first one is that this really gives us an opportunity to move away from the rest centric, Western centric framework. Because a lot of this normative and also those uh, imaginations and the framework were based on liberal democratic context. And uh, so maybe this is an opportunity to reimagine uh, this field mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to de-Westernize that. The second implication is that a useful lens to rediscover the largely deinstitutionalized, decentralized, and guerrilla style journalism in China. Like I just said, what is journalism? Who is doing journalism? Maybe it's not institutions. Maybe it's not some centralized forces. Maybe we should look at more diverse set of uh, practices that can be considered as journalism. And also, it's a, I think it's a call to connect journalism with other fields, like popular culture, gender, interpersonal communication, etc. For example, gender, I think, is a really important field to connect, because nowadays, I think a lot of journalistic practice is really in this feminist discourse and feminist uh, 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 practices uh, on Chinese social media. So I think connecting those fields does not mean that journalism is not important, but it's an opportunity to re-emphasize its importance in a more comprehensive setting. So that's my
sharing and provocation for, for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I just uh, introduce myself. I'm a uh, Rose uh, Associate Professor uh, of Hong Kong Baptist State University. So I just want to continue Kuchin's uh, uh, implications in uh, journalism. Uh, so uh, when we start this, I ask myself all, all the way, why Chinese journalism still, still matters? So I just try into thinking some constructive uh, uh, perspective of uh, the importance of Chinese journalism study. But we, we do have a, a conversation before the meeting. So what is the definition of a Chinese journalism studies? Uh, by we can do it by like a geographic definition or we can do it by language definition so uh, if we use like a geographic are we only focusing mainland china or we should including like taiwan and uh, maybe other uh, other chinese society for example in southeast asia we have malaysia and also uh, singapore so that will expand our study scope right and uh, we just discussed maybe there is a uh, quite popular now, Sinophone. Uh, the, the term is maybe it's more <laughs> appropriate to, to describe what we're uh, studying. And also, if we're using the language scope, so we have a lot of uh, like uh, diaspora media nowadays. And uh, it is also very important to study how uh, Chinese people, I mean, uh, from uh, different uh, origins, from mainland, from Hong Kong, from uh, Taiwan, and they just do a lot of uh, journalism uh, in uh, overseas. It's, uh, I mean, geographically, not in the Chinese definition of uh, like uh, China or Chi Great China or as a Chinese society. It's uh, quite difficult, I think, because English is more uh, inclusive than the uh, the, the Chinese uh, definition, I mean, Chinese character definition. So that's uh, answer the question. Uh, enrich the existing literature because of the size of the population, which is uh, Chinese speaking, or the size of the uh, food by nation, <laughs> the size of the country, or the, uh, the geography uh, uh, definition, or so that's why it is so important. We still need people to do that. Otherwise, like the, the whole world, like uh, journalism studies is more Western centric and uh, there is a lack of a piece of the important piece of the, uh, of the earth. And uh, also, uh, I would say Hong Kong is a very uh, interesting or important example for a case study because personally, I recent two years, I'm a focus on Hong Kong. Compared with the uh, mainland China journalism study, Hong Kong is a relatively more smaller, minor, uh, tiny pieces and uh, less people to do journalism study in Hong Kong. But actually, Hong Kong do provide a, a very vivid example how open society are vulnerable to be uh, to be to be influenced by the authoritarian regime and uh, how uh, one direction information flow or influence the uh, media landscapes and also the media consumptions um, ecosystem in an open society. So it can be demonstrated to the world to see the difference and to do the comparison also to show uh, like a showcase. Um, Cross-border journalism studies, because uh, as you know, uh, if we talk about international communication, uh, the Chinese uh, mainland China, uh, the PRC, they spend a lot of money on the uh, great uh, international <laughs> communication. So uh, it is also very important to the uh, cross-border journalism studies to see uh, how uh, the relationship between the uh, uh, the news outlets and the uh, the state and the relationship between the audiences and the uh, state media. So all those are very important uh, to study. And also diversity in the journalism, because we are talking about like cultural, uh, cultural context. So personally, I uh, am going to do a, a project about the, uh, the gender issue. So uh, we are all talking about Confucius culture. Uh, society uh, in uh, Great China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and uh, mainland China, but you will see uh, the role of media and uh, news media, 
but of course social media, the news also social media uh, and uh, uh, news media in the Me Too movement. You will see the different styles of uh, reporting, uh, uh, the rape culture in uh, journalism and uh, in news reporting. And also you can compare uh, the cultural uh, uh, context in, uh, in, uh, in the Me Too movement in the Chinese society, but in different uh, geographical places. So, and uh, yeah, thank you. Next page. Thank you. So uh, what we can do and we're, what we're going to do for this network. So uh, first of all, we want to generate uh, ideas. This is uh, very important because uh, the research questions are always a uh, uh, very tough uh, issue. So we just want to provide a platform we can uh, uh, share our ideas on, uh, on, on studies. And also uh, we can uh, uh, share uh, studies, uh, the results, I mean, a lot of the publications uh, which are related to this field so we can uh, provide uh, like we're going to uh, have like monthly newsletters so please join our mailing list so you can uh, uh, to have a taste of uh, the new uh, newly published studies so got more ideas about that and also support for the emerging scholars so we uh, highly encourage, uh, encourage like uh, uh, junior scholars or phd students uh, who are interested in uh, uh, Chinese journalism studies, so we can uh, provide them more resources. So through this uh, network. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm Haiyan Wang from University of Macau. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Sharon George and uh, the Media Center for Hong Kong that you invited me to Hong Kong. Uh, not here. Uh, so I'm very glad to be involved in this conversation about uh, journalism research, Chinese journalism research. Um, actually, like my colleagues here, <laughs> Rose and Kocha, I also come from an industry background. I've been a journalist for uh, so many years, and uh, uh, that naturally lead me to uh, journalism research as an academic. And uh, I would say, uh, over the years, I published some work and I spoke in some conferences and collaborated with some cross border uh, teams. And uh, most of my experience has been positive. But I do share uh, the concerns that uh, my colleagues have raised that the overall the field of Media and the journalism studies the field is uh, uh, is Western dominated, and uh, um, just last this is uh, Cheren's article. Just last year in uh, in the Paris uh, ICA, and Cheren made this uh, compelling uh, call um, about de-Westernizing political communication, referring both to the ICA division political com and the, the journal political communication, and suggesting they should rename themselves if uh, they are Western uh, uh, in all and after all. And uh, uh, so actually, uh, before coming to this talk, I was uh, in another conference that is the uh, Future of Journalism Conference in the uh, in Cardiff in the United Kingdom just last week. And uh, uh, as you can see, um, the, this is the ninth meeting of this of this conference, and uh, the overall presence of the Global South is pretty thin uh, in that conference. I used to see Sharon there, but not this year. And uh, to be honest, as a Chinese scholar. Uh, I felt a bit lonely in there. Um, as it turned out, uh, out of the uh, total 160 or something uh, presentations, and, uh, and uh, my presentation is the only one on Chinese media. And, uh, and um, you will wonder uh, the reasons, right? The reasons for this pretty thin uh, presence of the global south and, of course, China. Uh, there are many reasons, various, right, and the practical reasons as well. But it just reminded me uh, that um, you know there are many obstacles we need to overcome in order to be seen and uh, to be heard. And uh, de-westernization is a long-term project for many of us. And I okay. 
So, so I think we need to think what we uh, need to do as a journalism scholar and what kind of uh, research we can bring to the table to be involved in the conversation. I, I also borrowed this uh, framework from uh, Harold uh, last well many decades ago, and I think journalism, like many other uh, communication of, uh, activities, has its own five W's. So who says what, in which channel, to whom, with what effects, and uh, each W points to a domain of research, and that includes the research on the journalist, uh, both professional and amateur journalists, as well the everyday kind of news workers and. Uh, the content, news, and, uh, and uh, they could come in different forms, textual, visual, or audios, or different depths, story, narrative, or discourse, and today they have different claims to choose. It's interesting. Uh, misinformation, disinformation, or fake news, toxic news, right, today are, is, say, is uh, prominent in our uh, society. And of course, the study on the media, whether you see it as an institution of all or a set of organizations, or you see it as a kind of technology, a kind of platform or interface. And the study on the audience and uh, what do they do with news? Or today, people are uh, asking what they are not doing with news because they're avoiding news, right? News avoidance is quite a popular topic uh, these days. And, uh, the study on the social consequences of, uh, uh, of the whole process, uh, having journalism or not having journalism. I think we haven't done enough uh, research yeah. of these domains. Um, and uh, and uh, I think the problem we are facing now is that uh, we probably we are adopting a very uh, narrow definition of journalism. We see it still uh, according to a very Western-centered uh, framework in a very classical uh, way. Um, in fact, as a, uh, a senior professor who used to work here, you saw him on the screen, and uh, he, he told me quite a lot, quite often, journalism is what journalists do. I do agree with him, right? And uh, journalism is a construction, it's open-ended. Uh, the things like uh, me and Rose and the question we did in our journalist career, is certainly journalism, right? The hard kind of journalism, but we, uh, it does not affect other people. For instance, the, uh, the popular, the, uh, the, the very famous fashion blogger, Li Beika, right? And uh, calling herself a journalist as a skill and, uh, and uh, saying that her uh, fashion blog is journalism and her company building on that is a media. So, uh, so we need to, I think we probably, we need to just throw out our arms and embrace this flexibility um, and to see what journalism, uh, what journalists are doing and uh, how journalism is defined. Uh, it defines it itself or it's defined by different social actors, including journalists themselves and the audience, the government platform, capital, and the, all, these, uh, all these structures. Um, so, uh, Having said that, I just uh, want to show you this probably example. Show you this uh, this chart uh, depicting the, uh, the, the 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 change of number of uh, newspaper employment in China. And so it's uh, so we have heard so many so many times that uh, journalists are leaving the profession, right? So this picture tells you exactly how many people have left. So it tells you that in 2020, uh, just in newspaper sector, we have about 110,000 110, fewer journalists comparing to uh, eight years ago. So you need to consider that each year there are about in China, in mainland China, 20 uh, journalism graduates entering the job market and many of them landed in those positions, right? So the people actually leaving uh, the profession over the years can be easily doubled. It's much, much more than even the, in the newspaper sector. So the question, the question we can ask is, is what happened to these people? So there are 110,000 or even more, 20, uh, uh, 200,000. What happened to them? What they are doing now? And what kind of job they are doing? Uh, so I think uh, it is worth uh, asking uh, this question because 
because that tells you how they compare their current job with journalism. And then to let us see what kind of journalism is, right? And then is there any possible ways for us to define, to come up with a new theory uh, about journalism? And also another picture of, uh, of this chart is that there are still 170 <laughs> people stay stay in journalism, right? So what they are doing, how what what is the working conditions is like? Uh, what kind of journalism they are doing, and what kind of journalism is changing? The journalism is changing, right? Um, so I think there there is a very strong current uh, of research today uh, to see all these changes to journalism as a technical issue. Everything is caused by technology, right? But uh, I think in the case of China, as well as in many other societies, and uh, and then uh, and then it's also uh, an issue about politics and economics as well. I think there are many questions we can ask. Just just uh, just this small example, and see if we can see the potentials of expanding. Uh, the whole journalism research, and then probably giving a whole new uh, perspective to study the field of public communication. Because some people left, they're still in the area of public communication. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, this is just what, uh, what I'm going to share for now, and uh, we can discuss later. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much to our uh, three uh, panelists. Uh, my mind is already buzzing with all the ideas that they have presented. Uh, so many possible avenues to explore. Uh, we will be inviting questions from our in-person audience as well as uh, virtually. Uh, while those uh, in the room gather your thoughts and uh, prepare to ask your questions, I know people are reluctant to be the first, but it's okay, you can be the first. <laughs> Uh, I will uh, though turn to a question uh, from the virtual audience, uh, but before that, perhaps just to uh, make one remark about uh, uh, something that we've heard a couple of times uh, from the panel already, uh, which has to do with the de-westernization agenda. Uh, and I do want to make it uh, clear, I guess, especially for our audience far away, uh, what I think we mean when we refer to de-westernization. It is not a call for uh, academic isolationalism or protectionism, right? Far from it. Uh, it is not to carve out a space for Chinese or Asian journalism that is disconnected from uh, media studies or journalism studies. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, it is because uh, we believe that by decentering um, the traditional centers of academic uh, power, uh, largely in America and the US, uh, global journalism and media studies benefits uh, from uh, questions that occur to us first. Uh, in the same way, if I could use a couple of parallels, uh, probably my guess is that Western disinformation studies would have been far better off if it had paid attention to disinformation campaigns in, say, the Philippines and other countries before it hit the West. Uh, similarly, in many other areas, uh, there are interesting phenomena that emerge first outside of the West, that are noticed by non-Western scholars, uh, raising questions that will be extremely relevant to the West itself. Uh, so I think some of the discussions that we've already had here about how we define journalism, what happens to, to former journalists, where does uh, uh, Chinese journalism take place when the institutions of journalism are declining, these are huge issues for global journalism studies. Uh, and I think we'll answer them better and ask sharper questions uh, if we are able to, uh, if we have the, the space to prioritize uh, agendas that we see as important. Yeah? Um, so just that one clarification. Uh, a question from the audience that I'm gonna use my uh, um, uh, moderator's prerogative to tweak. Uh, the question from Alice uh, Mercy is, uh, Sorry, Murphy, is how do you look at the future of Chinese doing journalism in Hong Kong? Uh, any chances for change in mainland Chinese journalism? Uh, what about uh, cooperation between reporters in mainland China and the world? I'm going to tweak it because this is not a panel about Chinese journalism. It's about Chinese journalism 
uh, research. Uh, so this is a kind of question that I think uh, industry conferences and professional conferences should uh, certainly be dealing with. So I'm going to tweak it like this. Uh, what is the future of doing Chinese journalism research in this part of the world? Uh, and how, given the fact that the institutional and political environments uh, on the mainland uh, in Hong Kong and Macau and outside of Greater China are different, there are different opportunities as well as different restrictions, uh, how can we um, do better Chinese journalism by cooperating with, on the one hand, uh, colleagues on the mainland, uh, who are where it's all happening, uh, as well as within uh, Hong Kong and Macau, and with colleagues far away, who are far away from the trouble, as well as far away from the ground. <laughs> uh, any ideas on how this sort of uh, cross-border cooperation can be productive? And have you been engaged in such cooperation? Or collaboration, though? Uh, actually, I uh, have been collaborating on a uh, cross-national project on the journalistic roles. Uh, and so it involves, the project involves some, some kind of 40 countries working together. And so we collect data, we use the standardized framework questionnaire and also content coding scheme of, of content analysis and then to see what kind of commonalities uh, we can have, you know, uh, people, journalism, we, we try to see the universality <laughs> of journalism in different countries, but of course we also see uh, uh, in different social contexts, journalism can be very, very different. Yeah, I think, I think it's worthy uh, doing that kind of uh, cross-national uh, collaboration. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It also takes a lot of effort, and then you certainly need a very strong leader that can unite, you know, this uh, cross-national team. Yeah. yeah thank you, uh, uh, on that. So I think Cheryl's question points to a very important issue we haven't really touched on, which mm -hmm. is the methodological challenges nowadays in doing Chinese journal journalism research because. As we all know China is becoming more and more closed to researchers. It's more and more difficult to conduct field work and interviews uh, in China. So I think definitely that's a huge challenge. But I think if we're talking about Hong Kong, of course my wish is that Hong Kong can maybe move for once, <laughs> for once more, for another time, like become a kind of hub for studying. Chinese society, including Chinese journalism, to use China, Hong Kong's unique position, uh, which is, of course, one, on the one hand, uh, still uh, more open as compared to mainland China, but on the other hand, is very proactively uh, integrating into uh, mainland China, the Greater Bay Area, etc. So maybe there are some opportunities there to build collaborations with mainland researchers, but also uh, uh, maintain the connections with the global uh, research community. So, but of course, that's the best scenario. Of course, the worst scenario is that <laughs> we could not do either. Right? So, but uh, yeah, I think that's definitely a very important issue that we should all consider and explore. But I, for me, my first personally, I think there's still uh, uh, opportunities there. I think that's a very uh, um forthright and uh, direct uh, answer that I appreciate. And I, uh, I think um, uh, it is in the end about, uh, we don't know what the long-term future holds for any of us. Long-term, we're all dead after all, right? But, <laughs> uh, but what I enjoy working, uh, why I enjoy working with uh, uh, colleagues like um, those we have here is that uh, that's not going to deter us from using whatever space and opportunities we now have, at least for the next year or two. And I think that's the spirit in which this uh, network is uh, starting its work. Uh, questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to continue uh, with the previous topic in terms of this like, kind of talking about the future of Chinese journalism studies. And also in terms of, like, I think a lot of us are doing research here based in Hong Kong. So I'm, all, I'm still kind of thinking about this um, 
openness of the research or what kind of topics can we do in terms of uh, research in Chinese journalism? And also in terms of the case of Hong Kong, I'm just thinking like when uh, Professor Wang was raising this um, numbers that there are this declining uh, news employment in the journalism industry. And I was thinking maybe like one part of this reason is like, they don't feel like uh, comfortable anymore doing um, professional journalists and in this industry and maybe they're kind of turning into these academic paths so also like um, maybe many of you are also like this so and also in terms of the case of Hong Kong I'm just thinking like I think several days ago there was this news that um, the Chinese government were uh, asking for the information about some uh, government um, official embassy. Uh, yeah the embassy uh, officers their information from Hong Kong and then I, I think it's a quite a, it's a signal here that maybe that will be some trend in the future. And then what if this kind of trend is spreading uh, even wider to universities, to academia? So that's also one concern I'm thinking. And also, um, I think for young scholars like us, we're also considering what kind of topics uh, we can do. It is still a way for us to um, doing this kind of authentic, uh, uh, like authentic research, um, still for some uh, kind of politically sensitive topic. And is there a way through, or what's your advice for us? Uh, okay. <laughs> Since uh, recent two years, I'm focused on Hong <laughs> Kong. Yeah, now I'm doing like uh, audience, uh, a journalist audience relationship uh, by using Hong Kong as a case study. So first of all, it's can, uh, to show how the relationship changes uh, during the democratic backsliding. So it is a very good example. And also, uh, I think uh, I'm really interested in some of the topics which are worth to uh, explore, but I don't have time for resources. For example, like community journalism here in Hong Kong, it played a very important role. And also diaspora uh, journalism. And uh, there is a, a lot of a small size, a small small size online uh, media outlets. Now, uh, recently, uh, it's quite a flourish and all over the world, but not in Hong Kong. Uh, operated, uh, they were uh, run by the veteran journalists. Uh, so, uh, what was their role, their strategy, how they survive? Uh, that would be very interesting. So, I, I do still think uh, if using Hong Kong, is still have a lot of. Uh, Research topics we can uh, we can do. It's not uh, like sen very sensitive. I think it's okay. Uh, the only thing we uh, I used to study uh, the mainland China. Now it's uh, as Kachin said the, the thing is about the data, the quality of the data, because uh, sometimes even the textual uh, data I'm not sure about the completeness or the accuracy. And if you do in survey, I'm not sure uh, people the participants will give you uh, their true thoughts. Sometimes there will be a little bit of self censorship, or so they might uh, dodge themselves or give you the wrong answer uh, to protect themselves, or they refuse to do the survey. Or uh, when we talk about the field work, uh, actually, uh, we need um, that's the reality. If you're uh, overseas Chinese, you work for, I'm not sure about Hong Kong, but definitely if you work for a US university, it will be very trouble to do uh, field work in mainland now. So if you want to do anthropography or an interview, but the thing is we still have technology. So maybe you can use it online, uh, uh, those tools. So you still can do a small scope, a scope of uh, interviews about, for example, like the journalist studies that will be, still be okay. Yeah. So it's interesting that you have uh, the, the challenges that you've identified at the end have less to do with the um, uh, political risk to you yourself, but mm. really has to do with access yes. to good data. Right? And also, uh, uh, I think the risk is uh, you need to think about your interviewees or participants because uh, now the ethics it became very <laughs> issue. It became very important. Sometimes we are uh, scholars uh, maybe a little bit not alert to those risks. Maybe because of our study and the bring to our uh, interviewees or participants, so we need to think about that very carefully. And yeah. I'm wondering, uh, just uh, coming back to the doubts that um, 
not just junior scholars, but even senior scholars further away, who are not so familiar with the context mm -hmm. they have. Um, it is ultimately really about making certain political calculations and uh, managing risk, right? Yeah. Uh, would there be a role for your network in actually helping colleagues manage their risk? And just in terms of uh, sharing advice about how to uh, increase the chances of personal survival mm. right? <laughs> <laughs> in the extreme. Oh, uh, yeah, and, this uh, is a good so yeah, thing that, that, mm. that we, we definitely needed to think about, mm. like, uh, to share our experiences and uh, trying to find out like uh, how to protect our resources. And also, it's not only about ourselves, the researchers, mm. but also the sources. And, uh, but for, I know for many, um, uh, I mean, there's uh, millions, I think, not, not millions, but there are a lot of bright, critically minded uh, mm -hmm. Chinese nationals doing uh, graduate study overseas, mm -hmm. right? They um, have on paper the freedom to study whatever they want, no. but they are filled with, uh, well, while, as long as they're overseas, right? But no. it's still filled with, uh, <laughs> oh, because of surveillance and so on, they may yeah, not be, yeah. yeah. Okay. Their parents, so, so they, parents do they Their China. parents in China and so on. So, yeah, so, so the, uh, they have uh, rational concerns, right? Yeah. But my guess is that um, as much more experienced researchers, you would, in fact, be able to separate the, uh, the concerns that are, uh, they really need to take seriously versus concerns that maybe are not so serious and help them think through these things. Uh, wouldn't that be a form of very valuable mentorship that um, uh, experienced scholars like yourselves could provide? I think that's a good idea, but yeah. uh, I would yeah. not consider it as a mentorship because uh, <laughs> I, I don't think uh, any one of us has any definite answer to those questions. So I think more, yeah, I consider it more as a community, as sharing among this community. Actually, for next year's I say I, I remember there will be a session for scholars at risk, mm -hmm. uh, right? So at political risk, so they could uh, come together to discuss not only actually not only China but also of course, Russia, yeah. Iran, Turkey. Right. Yeah. So I do think yeah that's that could be very important uh, mission for for our network. I think we need to so-called decriminalize the feeling of doing uh, journalism studies in China. We, you don't need to have this kind of, you're doing something bad, right? Politics is only one thing about journalism. Journalism, uh, as I've just said, uh, like you need to have a much broader definition of journalism. Journalism is a kind of public communication. And uh, some PR people say they are doing journalism as well. Right? And uh, online Wang Hongs and uh, influencers, they are doing journalism. They say, we broke news, we break news. That's it. So if we, just, if we just try to see what they are actually doing, and uh, to really to see, to, to have some framework, but not very heavy, uh, burden of framework, existing framework, and then I think doing um, journalism research in China really, it can be a great opportunity, right? Because there's something wild happening here, and uh, nobody imagined that could be happening. And what does that mean? Uh, it's not only happening in, in China, probably in China, it's just like nobody can avoid it. It's become so visible in other places as well. So in that way, we are making contribution to knowledge, how we understand our society, our culture. In general, the public communication, journalism is one form of public communication. Here I mean the classic version of journalism, okay? Yeah. Uh, let me read out a question from the audience, more as a comment, because I think it's already been addressed by uh, Rose. Uh, Hi, I'm a student in journalism grad school in the US, and this is uh, Grace Shui. I did an undergraduate thesis about Chinese investigative journalism. During this process, I discovered the database for Chinese past newspapers is very fragmented. And she also mentions uh, hesitation to be interviewed. I wonder how do scholars gather sources and data 
for Chinese oh, yeah. studies <laughs> and how they conduct work. I think you've already talked about it, but yeah, I just, yeah, I just I'm just uh, <laughs> mentioning this that you know uh, the 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 problems that you raised certainly I think resonate with mm. uh, uh, grad students and researchers far and wide. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, other comments, questions from our audience here. Yes. I'm not from a very journalistic background, so pardon my ignorance, but something which keeps occurring again and again, uh, especially uh, this idea of you know decentralizing Western perspective or de-westernizing all of this. Uh, I just want to, you know, it's it's starting to feel like a lot of, um, I mean, talking with my colleagues, like more of this established young, uh, curious, uh, hopeful scholars, they're all noticing that this is becoming some kind of weird individual responsibility. And you know, this whole idea of de-westernizing should be on the people who hold the authority, people who hold the institutions, you know, it, it should it should be and this should be something which we push forward, but the gates need to be, you know, there is a lot of gatekeeping, a lot of journals are West uh, you cannot uh, you cannot work around uh, I, I mean if I write one paper without ignoring canonical Western thinkers, I end up seven pages of just trying to explain what these people who nobody knows about have been saying in Bangladesh or Nepal or India or Pakistan, you know? And this becomes like, um, such papers don't get entertained. Usually nobody wants to, you know, go through this eight pages. Of, if I use Alta Zero, cool, yeah, everybody knows what he's talking about. But then if you use some obsolete political scientist from Pakistan, they don't know what you're talking about. And this this kind of, you know, first question being like, yeah, okay, is, is this, Yes, we want, all want to de-westernize, but where do our powers and responsibilities lie, you know? Like for us, okay, we have responsibility, but we don't have power. And there are people who have power who are not taking the responsibilities from now. So and this then keeps up ending this echo chamber where we meet every half a year or so for, you know, some round tables or some pro seminars and they're like, oh, we need to de-westernize and then everything goes silent for a while. Like, wh where are these changes happening? Like, do people who hold power are also seriously reflecting on it? And I have another question, which is completely unrelated. So I don't know, should I ask it now or should I? Well, maybe later? let's uh, go with your first one, which is rich enough. Yeah. And if we have time, we'll come back to your second one. Uh, if it's OK, I will actually address yeah, that. Sure uh, uh, <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, the uh, responsibility should lie with institution leaders uh, and academic leaders. Uh, unfortunately, the battle, uh, I would say, is, is um, extremely discouraging. Yeah? Uh, because as you've hinted, those with the power uh, are unwilling to make the changes. And what I try to uh, stress to colleagues, both at our own university and elsewhere, is that, uh, I'm sorry, this is not something that we can blame the West for, right? Uh, because the West is not funding our universities or departments. We're funding it ourselves. Uh, we are among the richest economies in the world, at least here in East Asia. Uh, if our universities choose to give more points for publishing in so-called top tier journals, which, uh, what, 70, 80 percent of whose content is American and European, and we choose to treat these as top ranked journals, don't blame the West. It's our fault. Completely our fault. Yeah? Uh, so in a very practical sense, um, and by, by the way, I should emphasize that it is not really that there is a lack of publishing outlets. In fact, we, uh, the field, like all fields, has never had such a diversity and pluralism of uh, good publishing outlets. Uh, so for Chinese journalism, for example, there's the Chinese uh, uh, Journal of Communication, right? Uh, and there's a good reason why there should be a Chinese journalism of, uh, Journal of Communication. Uh, it's because, as you say, uh, it can take too long. It's unproductive to have to explain the Chinese context before even getting to your point, uh, which is what you would need to do if you're dealing purely with uh, editors who are unfamiliar with Chinese context, uh, American journals. So there is a, there's room for a journal like that, or for a journal like the Asian Journal of Communication. Um, whose fault is it that, uh, that our universities in Hong Kong and Singapore and so on uh, treat the Chinese Journal of Communication and the Asian Journal of Communication 
uh, second tier or third tier journals. It's not the West's fault. It's the fault completely of our own institution leaders who lack the self-confidence uh, to say that if these are our societies that we're talking about, we need to build uh, these outlets. We need to reward high quality research that for very good reason is, has chosen to publish in regional journals rather than in so-called global journals that are actually Western journals. Yeah? Uh, don't blame the West for it, blame ourselves, blame our institution um, uh, So I'll, I'll leave that as my answer to you and turn to, to other questions and comments uh, from the audience. Yeah, thanks. I have a question about the relationship between Chinese journalism study and propaganda. We know all the almost all the discussions in focus on the, the, the Chinese journalism research is being dominated by the discussion about the propaganda. And my um, myself also find the concept and the framework of propaganda so compelling. I cannot um, do research without thinking about propaganda. So propaganda, uh, we have been using the metaphor of sound and the earth. I think the, the, the propaganda, this concept of the framework is the sound in the universe of Chinese journalism study. So my question is whether we should try to jump out of this framework. Is it good to think beyond propaganda when we are doing research about Chinese journalism? Or if yes, how? <laughs> so this is my question. Um, okay, if you ask me that question, I would say propaganda is also a form of journalism. And to scholars, it is, yeah, because that is a lot of people do, as like, I would say, a million of people in China is doing propaganda. They see it as journalism. And then to us, it's a form, uh, it's just a way for a group of people or interest group or political parties to convey their message to the general public. That is public communication. Uh, so uh, if you ask me, I would say just to see what they're doing, why they are doing this, and then what is the relationship with the audience and in what dynamics it is happening so it's still a good area of study i mean instead of having having a pre-assumed this political judgment in that and then as scholar we see what is really happening in the field in the real in the real practice <laughs> Yeah, I think as uh, Jerry said, actually propaganda research can actually contribute a lot to, to fake news, disinformation research. But to directly address your question about moving away from propaganda, I think that means we should move away from this, uh, on the one hand, institutional-centered view of, yeah. of Chinese journalism. Okay. Right. Yeah, because uh, they are, of course, defined by the party as a more specific threat. So if we move away from that focus, then we see a much diverse picture. And uh, I think the other one is actually related to the de-Westernization, because that's when Western journal editors, when they see pieces from China, they would consider that to be the propaganda, to be the major thing. If your piece does not address the question of propaganda, they would consider your piece as problematic. So yeah, then, then I think that's a, a, a question, that's a problem for, for those uh, journal editors. Yeah. Sometimes it's their problem. It's not your problem, <laughs> really. Uh, yeah, I just want to say because if you study the content and the, in, the, in the mainland China, the state media, they, mm -hmm. they are propaganda. So and the media workers working for those state media, they're propaganda workers. So that that says no argument. But it says you can like do individual level if they left the media outlets, how they continue their journalism and their understanding of journalism, and then how technology helping individuals to uh, to practice uh, more professional journalism. So those are a lot of a bunch of studies you can do. Thank you. Uh, to, uh, we are kind of running out of time. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised because it's such a, a, a fertile topic. But I want to end by uh, asking each of you to um, uh, return to an, uh, something that uh, Rose mentioned, uh, the, the role of um, uh, this network and similar and, and other senior scholars in idea generation. Yeah? Uh, so let's say your audience is uh, research students or even more senior colleagues who are looking for a concrete research question that is rich enough to spend one or two years on, not 10 years on, 
just one or two years. <laughs> right. Uh, can I ask each of you to propose uh, one such research question connected to Chinese journalism that you think, if answered intelligently, will make us much smarter about what is going on in Chinese journalism in a couple of years when the research is completed? Um, so I, I have been always uh, wishing that uh, somebody doing research on a topic which is related to uh, my own point, the first point mentioned by that provocation piece, which is news is not a major thing that people consume. Mm -hmm. So what about China? Like, what on earth do Chinese people read or consume? <laughs> Actually, we don't know, right? If you tell me it's Douyin, it's WeChat, it's Xinjiang Toutiao, okay, but what kind of account, what kind of content? Mm -hmm. Is it purely dancing videos or <laughs> xiu cai or this kind of uh, influencers? So we, we, we don't know. Right? So I, I think this could make great, great contribution. If we get to know like what kind of content do people really consume. And uh, I think that could be answered by computational uh, approach, could be answered by other approaches, maybe survey. But uh, I always want that people uh, there are some people doing this kind of research. Thank you. Uh, so I just uh, recently uh, finished a book review for uh, my Tree Noise uh, China assignment. So it's an oral history starting from pre-1949 to 2021. He interviewed more than 100 US correspondents based in China. So uh, when I write the when I wrote the the, the review, I wrote the a thousand words review for him. So I just think, okay, that will be a dream job for me if I can do. I hope someone can do to do an oral history about the Chinese correspondence, <laughs> maybe in U.S. I think starting from around 1949 to now, you will see a lot of changes in their role as their relationship with the state and. Uh, 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 you, you you can witness the changes of the both United States and uh, the the, uh, the the PRC, and you can see the foreign policy, uh, journalism as a uh, parent, uh, if you through the journalism uh, perspective. So yeah, that that if someone interested mm -hmm. in doing that, that would be very interesting. Or even oral histories yeah, of uh, oral journalists history. uh, in the golden age. Yeah, in, yeah, in the eighties, nineteen eighty. Oh no. Golden Age is 2000. 2000, before 2000, starting from uh, 1990. Yeah, 10 years, uh, 10 years, 10 years. So if you interview those journalists, you already did that. <laughs> <laughs> interview those uh, correspondents, foreign correspondents, that will also be very interesting because through the comparison, you will see maybe their uh, daily practice or their role will change. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think there is a theory building work we we need to do and we can do um, because journalism is right now is defined as I just said in a very narrow sense. Right? When we think about journalism, we have this classic idea about journalism that is uh, according to the professional professionalism framework that is largely Western, I would say. Um, but look at what is happening in China. Many things happened, and, uh, and they are called themselves journalism. Right? Propaganda is journalism, fake news, they say journalism, and uh, PR journalism, and uh, even TikTok, yeah. yeah, journalism. So, so these all different kinds of journalism, perhaps we, to avoid the burden of this, uh, this classic notion of the term, we use public communication, right? So these are the different kinds of discursive practices of public communication. And then we need to have a theory uh, about that and then to see uh, where we can locate the classic version of journalism and where do we locate propaganda and then what, what is the social distance between them and also the social media content and then the influencers, nationalist influencers today a lot, right? Uh, so I, I, I think obviously this is an important work to do and also related to what you have uh, showed us, the Matt Carson's article. Uh, basically, he's not, he's not probably, he's, uh, he has uh, some awareness about what is uh, happening in, in China, but not, she's, he's pointing to that direction, right? But I, I just think we really need to 
uh, open our mind and, uh, and then to take into account of all these diverse uh, forms of uh, practices and, uh, and then to find a place, yeah, find a place of journalism, the classical version of journalism, and then it allows you to see other forms of communication practice as well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so this is not just uh, um, an occasion for intellectual exchange. It is also a celebration, right? a celebration of a wonderful and exciting part that I'm looking forward to, the, to seeing the work of your network blossom. And of course, like any good celebration, uh, we need some kind of ritual to celebrate with. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good Chinese tradition of celebrating the champagne. Oh, really? Oh. Uh, so unfortunately, Surprise. the center is oh. too deep. To oh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we do have this. So if I could invite our panelists to come uh, to somewhere more for the and and uh, wow. only one glass. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so as the guests uh, of the HKB, you two, you two hold it. Then, uh, if, does anybody want to pop it? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. one, uh, oh. Instead of singing Yam Seng or whatever, when I say one, two, three, you say pop. Okay. One, two, three, pop. Oh. Okay. Four. Oh. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Yeah. So, all the best for our colleagues and uh, we should. Uh, many productive years of research and may both Chinese journalism and Chinese journalism research see a golden age very soon. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.